Hi, Rachel, from my heart place to your heart place to heart place hospital podcast. <laughs> oh, beautiful. Thank you, Jackie. Oh, you're most welcome. And I, I always start by saying how I know the guest. And and Rachel, I I remember you. I remember you from, I don't know, maybe 13 or 12 years ago and the magical thing that you did through through a massive life curveball life event that you went through. I remember your little girl, Evie. I was a paediatric nurse out at Waitakere Hospital at the time, but I'd worked at, I'd worked at Starship. So I was really familiar, yeah, and and I just I just oh full body tingles. I just remember um, how you alchemized, you know, such a such a ride, and you created this book called um, with all these gorgeous superheroes in it. <laughs> and I remember it touched me so much because um, I've been a health professional, but. But more so that I'd been a kid who had gone through a health journey as well. And um, albeit I've got a big scar, whopping scar down my chest, I'm a, I'm a heart kid. Um, uh, mine's pretty hidden. Like my my superpowers are pretty hidden. And um, so it was so cool to see this this book like on display and really seeing that. And um, I, I, I still now coming full circle I still remember being a little girl and and not seeing differences in people and for you to really push out that piece um oh it just made my heart sing it still does it still really does so um that's how I that's how I remember you I still remember you and then you popped up on my LinkedIn and <laughs> and what grabbed me was my bio was feminizing the health and education system, and your bio at the time was humanizing the health and education system. And I was like, I, I need to know this lady. <laughs> I need to find her. I need to find her. And um, so we connected. And one of the first things I said to you was, Do you know Amy Scott? <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. So if and when Amy hears this, she'll be like, she'll be cool. It'll be classic, yeah. And so when you said you knew her, I was like, yeah, I'm in good, I'm in good company. <laughs> yeah. Oh wow, gosh, I love that you can remember that time, you know, twelve years ago, and just since I've put out the book, you know, it's ten years this year, the anniversary of putting out Superpower Baby Project in New Zealand, and it's quite amazing just thinking, what a journey that book has had and what a journey it's allowed me to have and continues to have. And just, I think that at it, at the time, I didn't know of any other books quite like it. And so it felt quite like this is the beginning of something. There were people and murmurings and rumblings around, we need to do things differently and this can be done better and more um, compassionately and human focused. And, and I, at the time I was just, you know, a baby, <laughs> like yeah. pretty much just a young person not really knowing what to do it's like I just want to make a pretty book you know not really realizing the impact that it might have um on the world and on myself but I just wanted to make a pretty book that honored my beautiful daughter Evie and all of the other children like her in New Zealand so yeah it's amazing now to think you know this is where that's led to to me now working in this space full time yeah yeah I love it because I and I think more and more people are coming back to this. Like I, like, why has someone got special needs and someone doesn't? Like, why why is someone normal and someone's not? Why is someone neurodiverse and someone's neurotypical? Like, ultimately, we've all we've all indigenous from the same bacteria that created the <laughs> the mitochondria that created the human beings that we are. So. Um, yeah, it's something that I re I've really sat with and questioned, and and um, so I think your book and yeah, you were so before your time, <laughs> um, and that's something that I get told a lot, and um, and I get it because I, I I'm, I'm a visionary, so I see things, and I don't sit. They used to sort of take five or ten years to come about, and now they're coming about a lot faster. Is is that something you're experiencing as well, my? A lone wolf on that one. <laughs> I'm not sure. I don't know if I would consider myself quite um, as a visionary. I just, I guess, I follow the little pathway. I feel very led to do things. Feel very intuitive about my work, and I feel 
extremely grateful that there is a place for me in this world and what I deeply believe. And even to your point around, you know, who decided what normal is and, and now, you know, inclusion and diversity are, are buzzwords essentially and they've almost become meaningless. And I think even that language, because I'm super passionate about language, as you know, yeah. even that language is divisive and othering. Like as soon as you label somebody diverse, you've labeled them not normal <laughs> like, mm-hmm. by default. And it's like, this is ridiculous. The diversity is natural humanity we are so the same like why are we creating these labels that only separate and alienate groups of people based on arbitrary measures and so even this you know diversity um and inclusion it's like well all of those that aren't normal they belong in the diversity category so well that's dumb (laughs) <laughs> like, yeah. are we all belonging? <laughs> so like, can we look after the needs of everybody and not call this group diverse because they need, you know, other things? That, that people need all sorts of different things. And, like, why can't we just acknowledge that people have needs and cater to them? Mm. Full stop. Yeah. <laughs> but I guess um, we haven't really explained what you do now. Why are we not really acting on? Great, Charlie. So I'm gonna I'm gonna read your lovely little bio, um, which you've shared with me because I just loved it. So you're an international speaker, an author, a trainer, an award-winning artist, drawing perspectives from art, science, your own lived experience in health in the disability space, and you share how language shapes our landscape and that the words we speak influence the behaviour, attitudes, and beliefs of ourselves and others. And you advocate for transformative language that reduces alienation and trauma and builds honour and empowerment. Our words matter and they contribute to health outcomes and how how a person experiences healthcare. So I love that and um, totally lands for me having had a health journey as a young person and I, I'm a Gen X, um, so I was in the 70s, 80s going through my health journey and there was no consent, body autonomy, sovereignty that that went on at that point. In fact, um, there wasn't even any psychological support and there was no facilities for my parents to stay the night. So it was quite um, quite, quite a minefield when I reflect back. Yeah. 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 So um, it was, it's was. it been a, a little bit to unpack. Um, and it didn't really surface for me until I actually hit perimenopause. So um, I'm a big advocate of that menopause or perimenopause, the hormones aren't the problem, they highlight the problem. <laughs> and so for me, it was really um, facing those times. And a lot of them was was language. So one of my, my first diagnosis was a cardiac um, defect. So from four years old, I, I, had, I had a label of, um, being defected um, and that that continued and even through lots of my rites of passage so throughout menstruation it's you know lots of words around our um, our when we before we bleed around our and um, the way we're showing up um, so PMT you know like on you know are you about to hit shark week all these sort of yeah horrendous things um and then again through motherhood and um so I had large babies I had 11 pound babies um and so I was um failure to progress so failure um and uh if you look at my if you look at my human design you look at my gene keys you look at my um my um gallop strengths I'm an achiever. <laughs> like I don't do fail. <laughs> I don't do fail. Thank <laughs> um, Yeah. And I think a lot of that was because it was a real coping mechanism for me. Like I had this real belief if I was really good and did everything super, super well, then these bad things wouldn't keep happening to me. Um, and so perfectionism and people pleasing was a real a real it was it's, it saved my life you know so I'm grateful for it but it, it could have like gone on for a shorter time <laughs> um 
and but it all really stemmed from that from those languages and um from those words and even now like i'm i'm lots of my friends are like you need to write a book i just cut to download and come up with all sorts of um words that just land um but um yeah, so in something that I love and I've shared so much, I can't tell you, I haven't told you how many times I've shared this with people, but was your experience when you went to Montana with Nathan and you were in a room full of patients and health professionals? And I just wonder if you could share that experience because I just thought it was just epic. It was an amazing, amazing moment in our work. And again, to that point of the belief that language shapes our landscape and what we say uh, is kind of like the manifestation of the things that we uh, feel or believe. Uh, and so we wanted to get to the heart of this this group of people. There were 70 of them and, and half of them were healthcare professionals and half of them were families with children with rare um, and genetic conditions. And there was a lot of tension in the room. And so we needed to diffuse the tension in order for us to be able to share our beautiful work with them. Because the whole point was around relationship. Like I think that healthcare, it's it's a relationship. It needs to be balanced. It needs to be equal. You know, the word hospital uh, comes from the same etymology as hospitality and hospice, which carries with it that energy of the kindness of strangers, you know, guest and host. They, it's a reciprocal relationship. And, and often in healthcare, it doesn't feel like that. There's a hierarchy and there's a power imbalance. And so we, we were very acutely aware of that energy in the room and we needed to kind of create it an equal space and a safe space for everyone to be honest and so we did an exercise where we gave everyone pieces of paper and they just had to write hcp if they're a healthcare professional or p for parent on the top of their page and then we, then we asked them a question and we said look think of the difficult behaviors you've experienced if you're a healthcare professional what are the difficult behaviors you experience from patients and parents who come to see you and so you could feel the like the grumbles in the room and they're scribbling furiously all these negative behaviors that they'd experienced. And then we asked the same question to the parents, you know, what difficult behaviors have you experienced from your healthcare professionals? They scribbled them down. And then we asked them to write on the same piece of paper, you know, how do these behaviors make you feel? And so they wrote some big things down and you could tell they were really purging this out. You know, there was a lot of energy in the room. And then we said the final question, why do you think they're behaving like this? And then everything just went really quiet and you could sense that things were starting to shift and they really thought deeply into the space of the other person. So the parents were thinking about the healthcare professionals. Why are they behaving like this? And I wrote all their answers down and then we gathered all the papers up and shuffled them around and then we asked um, a few people to read some of them out. And the room it was all anonymous and it was just incredible because what we realized was that everyone was experiencing the same things the difficult behaviors that the parents were accusing the healthcare professionals of were the same difficult behaviors that the healthcare professionals were accusing the parents of and the feelings and how it made them feel were the same feelings you know we feel we feel disempowered or we feel exhausted and we feel like we're not being listened to we're not being valued or understood i feel like I'm useless, that nothing's landing. And then and that final beautiful question, why are they behaving like this? And then just the awareness that they all brought to that space of, well, maybe they're stressed, maybe they're exhausted, maybe they haven't had enough training, maybe they've got big things going on in their lives. And like, maybe they're just on the last appointment of the day and they're just done and it's not their fault. And so all of this beautiful compassion was then in the room. And when we kind of could show it to them they, it was like everything just melted away and they became humans to each other and then the rest of that session was around collaboration and partnership and and saying well this is what I need from you and healthcare professionals saying well actually I didn't know that that makes a lot of sense yeah I can do that for you <laughs> I'm just mm-hmm. a beautiful beautiful human connection which is I think the heart of healthcare you know well-being yeah, yeah. Definitely. Oh, I just, uh, something that you said right at the beginning that I really want to highlight, but I want to go back to compassionate care as well, is, um, so I often get questioned why Heart Place Hospital? And to, I, I'll be honest, part of it is tongue in cheek. Like, <laughs> it is about, it is about creating a, a healing health system for sure. Um, but it also is exactly that, the, the definition of hospital being 
hospitality and bringing in, in stra- welcoming in strangers. So thank you, thank you for oh, saying that. Totally in sync. Yeah, that's amazing. Yes. And then going back to compassionate care, like I, um, yeah, sadly it's it's not something that's taught and 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 I call it training in healthcare because it is it's a training. The same with education, it's teacher training. Like that, it's it's not a it's not a beautiful education. It's it's a training of of um, spilling out academia. So, um, but there's so many of us who are who are born with that compassion, you know, we've got that compassion and we've got that healing ability. However, we never saw anything else. We only saw healthcare or education. So we were gravitated towards there. And then of course, uh, we get what's what I call um, com- compassionate and, and moral fatigue. Um, society often calls it burnout. <laughs> or as I, I, I sort of more see it as a and the explore, exploration, exploitation of those who, who have big hearts. And and so it shows up with, and like you, you've mentioned as well, you know, our experiences in our environments manifest our physical, mental reality. And so when we see this decline in mental and physical reality in our health professionals, but also, you know, our patients and our parents who are caring, we're all carers in, in that environment. Um, it's, it's that we're, we're not... We're not heart. We're not in it with our heart. We're not, and we haven't found our centre. We haven't, we haven't come back to that centre and, and that place of love, which is what's drawn us all there. And um, and then it, and then it manifests, like I said, in our me- mental and physical reality. And I think I told you this last time we spoke. I had to go into hospital recently for an appointment, and it said, "Do you have any cultural needs?" And I just, I just put. I'd like to receive compassionate care <laughs> and love, <laughs> and it worked in my favour. I worked in my favour. I had the most phenomenal experience, and um, you know, bear in mind that health is, you know, a big big trauma of mine. Um, and I have I've spent many years um, writing letters of, well, as an as an ally, um, expressing solutions. But this time I wrote a letter of just pure praise. I was just like, you nailed it. Um, it was so beautiful. And I, one of my favorite things, and I've done a lot in the last eight years through my own healing journey and then sharing it with others, is com- compassionate conversation or nonviolent communication. And I, is that something that you share and use? Is that a yeah, it's an interesting one because a lot of my work now is about facilitating conversations, you know, because, you know, when we're working together, a healthcare professional or a patient or a family, it is all around conversation. And there's been a school of um, training that's been going on for the last, I don't know, 30 odd years, you know, breaking bad news. So the healthcare professionals are taught this, this is how you break bad news. But to me, that it's that's still very aggressive breaking bad news you know somebody is deciding that this news is bad and that they're bestowing that language on that patient this is bad this is wrong this is bad no matter what it is this is bad you know and that energy that language it follows you like it did through your life being called defective or um, you know incompetent or a failure to progress you know this is bad Mm. um it can be difficult this is it, it can be also difficult conversations, you know, but if you go in thinking you're, not, you're going to have a difficult conversation, you're most likely to have a difficult conversation. So it's the way that we label the expectation of what we're about to share or, or what's about to happen. And so being really aware of what kind of conversation do I need to have in this space? Is it tender? Is it compassionate? Is it, is it straight up and down? Is it honest? But labeling it difficult or bad or negative or hard Those things will naturally be experienced, but by labeling it as such, it will be so. But what if you label that conversation? This is, this is going to be something hard to share. I need to have a really loving, kind, compassionate, honest conversation. And I wonder if that changes the way that that conversation plays out. Oh, I felt it. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, right in my heart. Yeah, right in my heart place. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. So, just being awareness of language and how we say things. Um and and 
And healthcare professionals are tasked with sharing some really big, life-changing news to patients every day. Big stuff. Mm-hmm. And so, of course, that's going to be difficult. That's going to wear them down. Like if they are compassionate, heart-led uh, physicians, they will feel that acutely. And so, to your point, you know, this is where that that exhaustion and that fatigue, I think, can come from. And so over the years, I guess they learn to kind of shut that off. And, and the longer they've been in the system, sometimes that can be the case. And it's like, but what if there was support for those kinds of conversations? You know, when physicians are giving this kind of news daily, hourly, what are the uh, mechanisms to support those that are supporting the patients? You know, and I don't. I think that's something that's incredibly lacking in the health system is how to look after the staff. And um, I have a firm belief that healthcare should look after everybody under the roof. If it's a hospital, if it's a service, if it's a clinic, it has to look after everybody. So the idea of patient-centered care is all very well and good, but that. Uh, excludes the healthcare professionals delivering that care. So that doesn't work. It needs to be everyone. So that's the cure of yeah. care. Yeah. Oh, Lord. thank you for saying that. Well, that's Heart Place Hospital. <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm so good that you exist. I'm thinking, well, it, it's not working. It's a broken system. Everyone is stressed. Everyone is exhausted. Everyone's fighting each other. And what they're doing is they're actually fighting the system that is working against them to do the thing that they need to do. And it's, yeah, it's exhausting for everybody. Yeah, it is. And um, so um, I feel like we've got a solution. (laughs) (laughs) I feel like we've got a solution and and, um, we've just got so much, so many anecdotes now of of frontliners um in health and education who have come through heart place hospital and it's and it's bespoke you know we meet them where they're at um you know if they've and this was me like i i don't even think i'd learned how to breathe or had a pedicure eight years ago when when mine all came up and um i call it my mat trap moment um and I'd had the taps on the shoulder for many years and the four by four on the back of the head and it took the mat trap to really put me on my knees to to awaken, to awaken. And that's what we're seeing now with Heart Place Hospital is, is those who, um, what society calls burnout, I actually kind of go, oh my goodness, yes, <laughs> we're going to waken up someone else. Um, and but that's not, I you know I I've been to this school of hard knocks and I that I I prefer people don't go to the, that school it's not it's not fun um, and I know I know for a fact if if the reason that I went into healthcare had it been addressed really at the, right at the beginning if I had been been you know language and and um, my my mindset and my self care and energy work. It needs to the inner like the mindset and the self care is not enough, and mm. and the language is so, you know it's called spelling for a reason. It's a spell, um, and I just believe if we can get that in early, then the ripple effect is huge. But also even if we get it in now to those who have been around for a wee while, they're in front of 30, 40, 50 people a day, and then those 30, 40, 50 people a day are then going home to and passing. 30, 40, 50 people. And so we can ripple effect it off out so much faster. And we know, I've said this already, our our experiences and our environments manifest our mental and physical reality. So if we want a simple and sustainable health and education system, we need to we need to address here and now, and this is why I call it feminizing, you call it humanizing, same thing, <laughs> um, is we've got to feel we've got to reveal, we've got to deal with it, and then we're going to heal. And I don't mean necessary cure, um, <clears throat> but part of that is we're quite death phobic. So in healthcare, we're, we, you know, CPR into the nth degree. Um, when I believe that when we can come in with these compassionate conversations, then we can actually see where, where people are at. Yeah. What is, hey, let's work in partnership agreement here. Let's have a healing roundtable just because I've come from doctrine and might have a white coat on doesn't mean that I am I'm at the top here. Um, we can come together and I'd love you know I'd love to hear like 
I think about it now, even as a little eight-year-old, I would have loved that. That would have been a lovely memory for me to have had. Um, whereas a lot of my memories were a lot of trickery and, and you know, hiding things and reward. And um, and I still see, I'm still seeing that in our education system. And, and, yet, and again, we're getting these young people out that we're having to CPR when, when if, if we can really start <clears throat> transitioning on a large scale, um, I can see that we can really make significant change. And and I, I get it. I've been in the healthcare system and you feel like despondent and you feel like there's no hope. Um, I, I really think there is hope. I You know, I've seen it. I've seen the transitions that take place. I'm, I'm an example. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, eight, eight, eight years ago, I wanted off this moving ball of energy, and eight years later, I I just I've got front row seats with a big pot of popcorn. I'm just like watching it all unfold. <laughs> yeah, do you do you have any any other insights? Like any other solutions? Do you think? Well, I think no. I love I love that vision, Jackie, and I just remember. Um, when I experienced such beautiful compassionate care in a conversation, it changed my own perception on of healthcare for when Evie was in hospital. And it was when she was in Starship and she was in a pretty touch and go scenario. And this incredible head of surgery, she had been explaining the pretty gnarly procedure that they'd considered for Evie to hopefully prolong her life after she would um, would be extubated um, and she said some things that just changed everything for me and she said look just because we can do these things doesn't mean we should and she said whatever you choose you're doing everything you can for your child and whatever you choose is the best thing for her so in that moment, in that sentence, she put our values as a family, what we believed about quality of life, what we believed was an appropriate intervention, what was too far, what was too much. Like she didn't judge any of it. She's like, whatever you decide, you're doing everything you can. And I know that as a parent, there's so much guilt. You know, did we do everything? Did we try everything? There's always the what ifs around these very, um, very painful life and death very big confusing decisions that you need to make and so she just gave us so much time and space and love to make that decision um and we chose not to go ahead with this intervention knowing that that might be where we said goodbye to Evie and and but we felt um devastated but at peace if you know what I mean the and, yeah yeah and she she survived that and then from then on I was like all right we now know what what we believe in deeply and we want a high quality of life for Evie no matter for as long as it is it, it has to be high quality that's what we care about yeah 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 and it was beautiful and I think sometimes we lose that that trade-off that idea of high quality of life versus um life and to your point of being death phobic I think sometimes Maybe there's an unspoken um, belief system in our culture that thinks a long life is the most valuable. But I think that every life has impact and every life is so sacred and so important and changes those around them um, with so much impact, no matter how how long it is. It could be a minute, a moment, a year, a hundred, you know. Mm. But that impact is immeasurable. Yeah. I love that. I used um a beautiful word there, sacred. And I just yeah, and just I love that because I just find, you know, our moments are sacred, our ceremonies are sacred, our community sacred, and that's uh, what I believe is part of being feminizing things is is that sacredness, um, bringing in Bringing in collaboration, bringing in partnership, bringing in um, that real feminizing side of things, and I, I just I really see that it being the panacea mm. to creating change and and to keep getting that simple sustainable. Because um, we're, we're always going to need a health system. We're going to need it. Yeah, 
And um, so let's let's create one that is is there for those that need it and those that don't, you know, because we are our own best healers, we are our own best lovers. And um, and I just I just see if we're um, if we're leading that we can we've got this inner barometer, this inner knowing, um, and lean into our healing roundtable to support us, to to guide us through, to doula us through, to steward us through. Um, yeah, I can I just see a big big difference. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah, yeah. It's so exciting. That is so exciting. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And I just wonder if um if you could share with us what's in your heart place at the moment. Like what are you cooking up? What's coming up? Like what are you open for? I know we've spoken and um, you know, certainly love you to be involved in Heart Place Hospital, which of course, um yeah. Yeah. What's in your oh, heart place? Now? I am living in a state of um excited anticipation at the moment like I wake up every day just going oh I can't wait to see how this day unfolds and and I feel like the work has been growing and building so slowly and gently which is the only way I know how to do things I'm quite a slow person <laughs> like I just I, I don't I'm not a hustler I things just kind of I plant things and hopefully they grow and you know hold everything so lightly um but I'm so excited about this year because the work is doing beautiful things in the world and that's just, it amazes me. And so I'm about to do some work with Pediatric Palliative Care Australia where I'm um, undertaking a train the trainer um, program for some of my work that's going to be used all over Australia, which is super exciting. And there's research opportunities um, coming through and then there's beautiful work that I'm doing with a company in America that are the peak body for muscular dystrophy to shin. So I'm facilitating the open-handed conversations with mothers who all have boys with um, muscular dystrophy to shin. And that's amazing because it's all about how do you hold on to life and, and also grief. So we're kind of understanding how to live fully and grieve fully and hold it all in tension and how to look after yourself. And it's just, yeah, it's beautiful work. And then there's potential for some more books on the horizon and yeah, just interesting projects and it's like all of these things are just all of my end life is just in this big melting pot and these cool things come out of it, you know. I'm like, oh, that's cool. I didn't think that that thing and that thing would go together and there it is. It's, there's that thing. <laughs> it's like, mm-hmm. it's a lot very exciting. Yeah. Right. So I have no idea what I'm doing most of the time. <laughs> I'm wildly excited about it. <laughs> well, you, sound like, you sound like you're in what I call flow. Um, yes. Yeah, I feel like um, I feel like this with myself too. I feel like I'm in flow, and I feel like I feel like divine timing has actually bloody showed up for like, the thing. Like, <laughs> and I like, eight years. Come on, divine timing, show up. <laughs> yeah, I feel yeah. It's been the same. I've been in Australia for seven years and started with a, sort of nothing. I had no money. I knew one person, which was Nathan, and I was starting this whole new life. <laughs> like, how the hell did I do that? Like. I'm so proud of that courageous seven years ago me version that and now I just I think man I would never have dreamed that all of this would be possible but yeah. and the people I've met along the way and that's the thing it's all about relationships and and connections and how beautiful is that like oh, I'm going to say yeah and you, you said a word you, you keep saying a word, I love all your words <laughs> I'm like oh words um Yes, you use the word grief, and um, and I'm I've got this. Um, I'm doing his work actually at the moment, Doctor um, Zach Bosch. He's an endocrinologist in the states, so he's he's doing intrinsic health. So he's done he's done conventional health and functional health, and now he's doing intrinsic health. So real real to the cellular, and has he has found his feminine. And he has said that it's the mothers and the grandmothers experiencing the deepest grief that they've ever ever experienced ever in a lifetime who will alchemize it into love and create like they've never created before. And that is what is going to change the world. And I just, I see that, I see that with you, Rachel, like, yeah, he's, um, he's quite hot. (laughs) 
<laughs> it's quite hot. I've invited him onto this podcast. He's on my desire list every day to come on the podcast. Yeah, he's, he'll he'll be on. It's going to happen. It's already happened. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and um, and that's what I see with with what you've done with with your journey with Evie as as you know as I'm sure as tough as it as it, as it was as living um being a little girl who who experienced the health system and then having delivered health care as well um and then um and then also having my own two daughters too so um thank you thank you i just want to say thank you for stepping in and taking that radical action um i know what it feels like it's pretty it's big and um it's often not necessarily supported um i was all my podcasts will be mentioning this but we're, we're, we're breaking glass ceilings but we're kind of getting cut a little bit <laughs> whilst yeah. we're doing that yeah um and so thank you for your thank you for stepping up and in staying standing and and um using all your goddess gifts um <laughs> And thank you for making the book and, and you know, it really le- did leave a big imprint on my heart place. And um, and it's just delicious to have been connected with you. And I couldn't really tell I know, I know we're going to do something together. <laughs> I, I know, yeah. It's really yeah. Amazing. Oh, so beautiful, Jackie. And yeah. thank you so much um, for everything you're doing in the world too. This is just the beginning. I know, right? Yeah. yeah. You've got to sell the popcorn now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I know I know you're not on social media, but you've got a beautiful website, which I just think is just gorgeous. Um, yeah. I love all your words, of course. And then, I, and then you're also on LinkedIn. So just if people want to find you. And um, I'm sad that you're in Australia. I'm sad New Zealand doesn't still have you. <laughs> yeah. I am getting to come over to New Zealand a few times, though. So... It is, mm. Yeah, it's not that hard. I open over now that you know things are opened up again. Um, you'll probably see more of me than you realise. Okay, well, <laughs> yeah, and a date. It's a date. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I love play dates. So, <laughs> yeah. Oh, thank you so much for being on Heart Place Hospital podcast and um, so thank you for having me. What a yeah. joy. Yeah. All right. I'll see you soon. Bye. Bye. Bye.